uh, where it's just it just works, even though it's not a formal view, well, and it's indeed. worth pre- preserving. We want to hang on to that. We don't want to build all over that or knock down the good bits. But that's the difficulty, isn't it? Because uh, that's a, the argument of beauty being in the eye of the beholder to a certain extent. But what you have proposed is uh, approved views or a list of views which we would never would touch at our peril. But mm-hmm. doesn't that exactly throw up the, the question that you raised, that some people will find beauty in uh, perhaps bits of, of land that other people might just find scraggy and quite happily build a great big condominium on if they could? Well, well yes, yes and no, and I'm, I'm sorry to sort of hedge my bets there a bit, but what we do at the moment, we, we already have some protections in there. So uh, we list individual buildings if they're very old, very special and particularly important, made by a particular architect. We already do that, and there's 5% or so of the um, Britain's buildings are protected in that way, so you can't muck them around. We have conservation areas and those sorts of things too, and even some specific views. I and mean, there's To take a famous example, you have to be able to see St Paul's, the Dome of St Paul's Cathedral from various different points around London, including the hill on Hampstead Heath and various other mm-hmm. things. So mm-hmm. we do that already. What we don't do is we don't say, look, there are other small-scale, informal, surprising little bits of beauty which mm-hmm. are equally valuable in a small scale, and we've got no way of spotting them and preserving them. So I don't want some sort of big, long list of stuff thou shalt never touch at one's mm-hmm. peril, but I do think we need to have some way of recognising and identifying this stuff, which is special, so that when somebody comes along and says, I want to put a whopping great big skyscraper here, and we can either say, yep, that's fine, it's not getting in the way of anything that's special, or alternatively, hang on a minute, there's something which no one has bothered to write down before which is worth keeping, and we need to have a mechanism to preserve it, please, now. Um, I think you're going to set off a lot of very interesting local <laughs> rows yeah. with, with this. Um, but but that, you, that's a conversation you, which hasn't happened yet. It, that's important. So you want the conversation, but ultimately you know, a list has to have a beginning and an end, and mm. it has to have some things that get missed off it, and that's then where the rows would commence. You're absolutely right. I mean, what happens at the moment, for example, if we list an individual building, English Heritage has this thing called the Principles for Selection that says, look, if you're going to list a building, it's got to satisfy a series of criteria. And then if someone thinks a building might, you can nominate it to be listed and English Heritage will say, yes, it does or no, it doesn't. Fairly straightforward. Now, if there's a, if there's a set of criteria which we can do that for individual buildings, and we do, why don't we start having to think about what that might be for some kinds of views? It's hard, I grant you, um, but there's beauty out there which we're just ignoring at the moment and we're probably casually destroying, and since we spend most of our times in yes. but, uh, life, life in, in towns and cities... Just let's, squ- let's squeeze one little answer out of yeah. you before, before we move on, which is how would <clears> that help create lots and lots of houses? You just have a very long discussion about well, lovely let, views. Well, because if you know what you're keeping, you also know what you don't mind if it changes, and that frees right. up an awful lot of stuff in areas of city centres that need regenerating, um, people can't stop you then if actually this is not something which is you know, uh, which is um, satisfying these criteria, you can get on with it faster, you don't have people trying to stop you. Does this idea appeal to you, Tony? Uh, well, I think one of the things that, that we do need to do in, in seizing the, the maximum benefit from nature is to design our urban areas differently. And, and one of the things I talk about at some length in the book is the benefits that people gain from being exposed to green space, to birdsong and to wild places. And since most of us live in cities, naturally, therefore, this is where we should be focusing on enhancing people's lives through incorporating greenery into the design of, of how we build the places where most of us live. And again, there's some really big numbers on this. And, and one study showing how there's a difference in, in, in average uh, health outcomes of about five years between those people exposed to greenery in their day-to-day right. lives and those who are not. It sounds and like you'd leave most of the views on your list, then. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about this idea of listing views? Officially approved ones, if you like. Well, I think I think that is a, is a problem, and, 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 and John's alive to it, that that um, you can't have a sort of a, a little quango who's deciding what's good for us and what isn't. But I do think that, um, I mean, just to take an example, something like the Shard, which has had such an impact on the London skyline, I'm kind of interested to know the mechanism that allowed mm. that to be there. I don't, I don't, there wasn't a feeling that Londoners who, in a way, should have some say in their skyline were exactly consulted on what it looked like. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, my concern with with this and with all the areas of public policy we've been looking at is that they're not held hostage either by a specific lobby group or an interest group or a specific mm-hmm. set of developers or, or, or companies or, or political interests. Um, so the process of decisions is really important, but also the transparency of the process afterwards, the, the, mm-hmm. the ability of a community to access how the decision was made and who had influence on it. 
Well, there we must come to our natural conclusion. Many thanks to all my guests today, the MP John Penrose, Nairi Woods, who's Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government in Oxford, William Fiennes, whose fable about the ash tree is in a collection for the Woodlands Trust called Why Willows Weep, and Tony Juniper's book What Has Nature Ever Done For Us is out now. Next week, Tom Sutcliffe will be in the chair to explore 40,000 years of musical history with John Adams, Howard Goodall and Stephen Polyakov. But for now, thank you and goodbye. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.